Hello, everyone. Welcome to Building Besser, a podcast that takes you behind the scenes with our Quantum Spin Studios team, where we talk about our process of building a completely original franchise IP from scratch. I am Victory Palmisano. I am Ann Hauk. I am Mike McCarg. Welcome. Okay, so almost one week ago tomorrow, we can't say with whom, but we hosted a really fun, exciting game in the heart of Hollywood, our small team. That's true. So we can't give a lot of details, but I actually didn't really get a chance to, we didn't get a chance to debrief together because we had to go our separate ways. I thought it went really freaking great, and it was a lot of fun for me. We did four hours, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, four-hour game. To tie it back to uh, last week, people were thrown. <laughs> yes. There were people being thrown in the game. And, yeah, I just – it was it was very fun. I, I actually wanted to play, but for reasons – we won't go into on the podcast. I was unable to. So I was an observer and I thought like, well, this is probably going to be like less fun because it's more fun to play. But I have to say, I was like completely captivated for every single second. It's almost like watching people play a TTRPG is interesting enough that people should make shows around that idea. No, It's like <laughs> if only someone thought about that, it's a great idea. Sadly, no one's done that yet. The funny thing is, is as I said that, like, I guess my internet froze for a second. And so you and Anne just both froze in, like, <laughs> looks of mild disapproval. And I was like, oh, God, what did I say? Was that mean? But it was just, it was just the internet being no, silly. No, only, only the highest approval. <laughs> right. <laughs> Mike, you were an amazing GM, as you always are. And Anne, you were fab. Was there something that stood out particularly to either of you? It's... That's the first in-person game we've been able to have since May. Yeah. And there, there is something that's just so much more engaging about sitting around the table in person, being there when the 20s are rolled, when the ones are rolled. There were several 20s rolled. It was like on fire. And several ones. <laughs> the the dice Amy bought yeah. were hot. They were extreme. They're like, it's either going to be critical success or critical failure. That's all you get. There was almost a death. We were very close to a death. Two. Two, two deaths. There were almost, there were almost two, two deaths, deaths yeah. from four feet away from the encounter ending in safety. Yeah. <gasps> I mean, I chills again. they were very close to two deaths, but you weren't that far from four deaths, depending on yeah. how the two survivors responded. Anyway. And I had a... Pr- okay, this is probably too wooey to keep in here, but we'll let Tanner be the decider of that. Too wooey. Everybody grab your crystals. We, Anne, Mike, Amy, and I had a, a little light bite to eat uh, last Thursday for for evening dinner and while remember we were at black cow and i was walking home with the baby strolling along and i encountered i won't even say what it is because i don't ever want to ruin a a little surprise in within the game but i encountered a a species that i've never seen before on my walk home and i videoed it because i was like what the heck is this And I sent it to some friends, and everybody was doing an investigation of what it is. Fast forward, not 24 hours. We're talking like 14 hours later to the game. That same species was a threat in the game. And I was like, this is so weird. I did not know that this thing could be this thing. And I just learned about it the night before, like in real life. And it was really a cool experience. And it's probably, I don't know if you think it's worth keeping in because it's like too mysterious for me to say out loud. You saw a hemophage moth with a two and a half foot wingspan? A hummingbird moth. I saw a hummingbird moth, but... I was teasing. (laughs) No, let me tell you. Moths to me are like these teeny tiny little like, you can squish them. Mm -hmm. This thing was this big. Oh, moths are metal. Like they and are. And I was literally animals. like, "What 
the heck is this? Like it was, I video, <laughs> yes, yes. Anyways, it to me felt like, you know, I still have my, my roots and the wooey roots. And I was just like, whoa, this means something. I don't know what it means, but. Well, uh, roll an intelligence check. We'll see what it means to you. Ooh. I was thinking it'd be really fun one day to come on here and do a little character creation simulation. Yeah. There is something intentionally structured in that uh, encounter for it to go from wonder, what's this super cool thing, to the horror of, oh no, it's killing all my friends. Mm -hmm. So it feels like you got to experience that a little bit in real life to game. Yeah. Truly. It was like such a moment for me. <laughs> Mike, did you have any thoughts about the game? You know me. Uh, it's very difficult for me to remember the game at all. I, wait, we went to that theater. Yes. We were in a theater. Yeah. The players are great. I remember the players were great. Just for the listeners to know, Mike is very much lives in the present moment. Whatever is happening in the present moment, that is what is top of mind. Anything that has happened in the past goes into like... Rolodex, people don't even know what Rolodex are anymore. It just goes into like a really back file and sometimes he can't access it. It's not because the event was unimportant to him. It just literally he like forgets because it's not happening right now. Is that an accurate description? No, I forget like everything you know, immediately everything. after it happens. Yeah, everything. Okay, Mike, to, to set the scene... The year was 1985. It was a dark and stormy night. I know. I remember. I remember. They were great players. We had a great game. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't stick the landing at the very ending as much as I wanted to. Um, but it was a great. It game. was a nine and a half, not a ten. I mean, that's the Correct. level of. I don't even want a ten. I want like, oh my gosh! Either that was the best game I've ever played, or that was the best experience of my life. And if I don't hit that, I'm like, I blew it. I mean, you you've made me tear up at a table before. I know that was a good one. You've seen you've seen ten out of ten. Like it does happen, but <laughs> you know it's the rare and elusive. But you get in like a nine and a half, or God help me, a nine point one, and I just fall apart. <laughs> Never recover from like a nine point one. <laughs> just forget it. We need to get a new GM. I'm terrible. Throw wow. out the whole screen. <laughs> We're done. I did like my <laughs> exile screen. Well, we have a lot of listener questions to get through. It blows my mind that we have listener questions. Like, I'm just going to be transparent for the you all listening. All of my delightful friends and colleagues were like, we're going to start a podcast. It's Building Vesser. It's behind the scenes of what we're doing. And I was like, no one's heard of Vesser. <laughs> no one has heard of Vesser. No one's going to be interested in a podcast that's building a thing they've never heard of. And Tanner and Victory especially were like, no, they, they will be. And I was like, no, they, they really. And I was like, but I, you know what, fine. I'm just going to be good team player. We'll make the podcast. I don't think we'll work. And then thousands of people listen and we get audience questions. So <laughs> it's 7,000 for the first episode. It's so, it's wild. Yeah. That's it. Uh, Thanks everyone who is listening for <laughs> sending in your questions. It's amazing, yeah. Like that, I, it's it's uh it's frankly more than I would have ever ever hoped or dreamed. And on our last episode, Mike mentioned that the amount of people who are listening is far greater than our social followers. So if you're listening and you have socials, it'd be so cool if you went over and found World of Vesser on any of the social platforms and gave us a follow. We would. We'd love to see you. I didn't really mean to go into that, but. That's smart. That's also the easiest way you can let us know what you want to hear on the podcast next time. Exactly. We check all the socials. And by the way, since we're doing plugs, if you are enjoying this podcast and you have anybody in your life you think would enjoy it too, will you share it and let people know to give it a listen? We love that. On to our dear listener questions. Our first one is from Rising Ty or Rising TY. I'm not sure. They ask, what is technology like in Besser? 
is there an era in human history that the development of technology is mirrored in Besser or is it even more advanced? That is really hard because you said an era in human history. So people on Vesser have always had access to emanation. Some percentage of people alive can do magic. So uh, that impacts the necessity is the mother of invention, right? So the necessities change, you know, like they didn't have to figure out how to strike flint against rock to get spark to make fire. You got your buddy with emanation to just make fire <laughs> just set the thing on fire just do, do the thing do ooh, do the thing you point the thing get the thing it's not and so technology on Vesser is very strange compared to our technology because in a lot of ways technology is not just pre-industrial but like <laughs> there's no compound machines really like there, you're not a thing with a with a bunch of gears and and a, a spring in the world, there's not a there's not a steam engine. There's not none of those things exist. And you know they can send messages across vast distances with imminent and sigil based communication devices. They had powered flight in their civilization comparable to a time when we had wheels. Like it's just it's it's a it's a completely different way of understanding technology. Technology for them augments emanation. It is a way to channel emanation without an eminent person there doing it all the time. You make an object eminent and then it does a thing. Well, lifts would be a great example. There are lifts among the Vasha, right? So you're at the first floor, you go to the third floor, you get on the lift, but the lift doesn't have pulleys or cables or counterweights. It has typically either sigils or emanation that make it, you know, rise and fall. So they are almost universally either much simpler than like maybe even Mesopotamian kind of technological era or sci-fi advanced. Like we still couldn't do it. Like there's a material called glass weave in the world that we could not manufacture even at prototype scale, but that is possible in physics and chemistry. And they, they you know, their craftspeople weave it all the time. There, there's something else, too, in the question is Rising Tide is asked which era in human history, but it's also which era on nausea, because you have the Age of Ascension that at the height of its like a mano arcane power was achieving things that we could not even think about. But where we're actually pointing the camera in exile and Hesh in what we're calling the modern era is post collapse of that. So there is a ton of technology that has been lost. That's, you know, what some expeditioners are going out to find are like the remains of this. So at one point, even though it's a very different technology that meets a different set of needs, they were far beyond what we're at now and essentially got reset with the Age of Consequence. That, that's something that's really interesting when depicting exile because exile is on the ruins of a fallen city. And so you have ruins that are more technologically advanced than the buildings and stuff that's being built on top of them. And so it just, it really matters when you're looking at what the correlation between, you know, earth technology advancements and Vesser. I mean, to kind of put like a finer point on it, even in the peak of the Amazov empire, there wasn't like a computing device in the world, nothing computed. It was nothing mechanized, like, in the world. But, you know, for energy production, they could create perfectly smooth, deep wells, like, as deep as they needed to tap thermal vents. Or for the Torifex building towers, you know, water scarcity was never an issue because no matter how deep the water table is, they can get to it. Like, it's just, it's, it's a, they just have a fundamentally different approach to technological development than we do. And I mean, it, it shifts the paradigm a little bit when you have people who are like wraiths and can just teleport as a part of what they can physically do. Or, I mean, the exalted that Mike mentioned last week that can melt the earth around them and get magma and all of that readily available. One, one small example is on earth, we really leaned into the use of rock, wood, eventually, you know, refining metals and all of that. And on Vesser, because of the natural skill sets of the people, where they're at, 
things like that, glass is the foundational material instead, because that, that was something much easier for them to access. They're not going to go through the process of refining metal that early on if they have something else readily available at their fingertips that can be used. There's actually a question on social media last week. Somehow it got missed. So I'm going to throw it out here. It's a little detailed, but I feel like it's really, really cool. Nicole asks, it's my understanding that players, writers, filmmakers, etc., who utilize Vesser as their setting will influence or create actual outcomes that affect the world going forward. A, do you have a direction that you want things to go? Lots of conflicts and systems sound like they are ripe for certain kinds of disaster, deconstruction, and rebirth. B. How will the elements introduced by authors, players, and creators be canonized or made part of the official lore? I think Mike alluded to this in a previous episode with digital asset management, but can you say more? All right. What? what okay. The first question was... <laughs> I know, it's a long one. Do you have a direction that you want things to go? Lots of conflicts and systems sound like they are ripe for certain kinds of disaster, deconstruction, and rebirth. One thing that bothers me personally about fictional media these days is everything has immediate existential urgency. When we look at the arc of human history... Empire collapse and institutional collapse takes forever. I mean forever. Not only did Rome not burn in a day, Yahoo.com is still around. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's a thing where, like, you know, we think this thing is like, it's about to collapse. And it does. But what it just, if anything gets any sort of institutional scale, collapse takes years, decades, centuries, right? So we've set up all these factions but they all have institutional resilience, which means they're all playing a very long game. And so what we want to avoid is, oh my gosh, Hesh is going to fall today. We have to save Hesh today. Because once you do that, like it can feel exciting once, and then you have to either raise the stakes or do it again. The fact is, even in Vesser, you know, a titan coming over the sigil wall would be about the only thing that could wipe Vesser or excuse me, a hash out in a day, but they they know what they're doing. Like they have an entire order that operates these sigil stela. A titan of that size is not going to get to hash and wipe it out in a day. So what we're trying to build for our players and for our screenwriters is a grand, epic, wondrous stage, a world that is truly spectacular, but the story stakes are personal. Will I survive? Will my family survive? Will I find love? Do I have meaning? Those are the kind of stories we're trying to get people to tell. And of course, there's a plan for what happens in the setting over time. And we don't say what that plan is because we want it to be influenced by people telling stories in the setting. People telling stories in the setting may crumple up our best plans and throw them out without ever knowing what they were. And we love it. That's our job. Our job is to support those kind of stories. But I, it's just really important to me, stories told in Vesser are human scale. They do involve competing factions, but that's one, to be an accurate reflection of the world that we live in. And two, it's like conflict is juicy. People like to watch conflict in media. So we tried to create high stakes, high interpersonal stakes conflict, but that the stakes of the conflict weren't, does civilization continue to exist or not? Yeah, I think with that as well, it also comes down into what we wanted to get out of Vesser as far as like an exploration of philosophy and morality and all of that. A lot of times in written or visual media, the actions of the people correlate directly to the grand storyline. So you have things be very black and white. Here are the good people. Here are the bad people. Everything is coalescing towards the main climax of the film where there's something that's going to happen that has world stakes. And I think a part of having the world keep spinning regardless of the stories being told and giving writers and, and GMs the information on all of the factions and allowing them to write their own stories and make their own decisions allows for them to be something that's a lot richer and doesn't tie the movements of people to the grand scheme of the world because that's not something that realistically happens 
And so we're able to get stories that are richer, they feel more realistic. As people explore the world, they make their own decisions. You start to see different factions through the viewpoint of different writers. It's how did they take that information and digest it? What are they seeing when we say like, hey, here's what's going on? And it's it's a really cool way to explore stories. One hero saved the day or one villain destroyed the world isn't a thing that happens on Earth. Yeah. And we do have a tendency in our narrativizing of society to try to force that template onto the world. But it's not. It's Gandhi didn't single-handedly liberate India from British rule, right? Uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King didn't individually push forward the rights of African Americans in the United States. Hitler did not alone cause a Holocaust or conquer most of Europe, right? They were people and their actions did have impact, but the main thing their actions did was inspire lots of other people to do something positive or negative for the society they lived in. And we want our setting to reflect that. One thing, too, that it reminds me of is just the other week, John and I were playing a game called The Deep Forest. It's written by the same people who wrote The Quiet Year. And it's set from the perspective of the quote-unquote monsters who inhabited the land that a band of adventurers came in. And it's how do they recover and rebuild after something that, from a traditional gaming perspective, you would view as a heroic action is like a debilitating event for the inhabitants of this land. Yeah, that's especially challenging in our setting. So we don't have a lot of like good versus evil. We have mm -hmm. a lot of different forms of life trying to survive in a difficult world. Yeah, they're just people. Yeah. Or emanoforms or titans or lichen or shank dogs or whatever. Or slime molds. Or slime molds. <laughs> Lots of slime molds. The second part of Nicole's question is how will the elements introduced by authors, players, and creators be canonized or made part of the official lore? Sure. The first thing is that we're going to have the most expansive and updated in real time world documentation that has ever existed. So we're going to do that using technology, good web services. So as things get added to the world, they get added to documentation. And there will be ways to add things that are in progress and provisional. And that only the people who can see those things, who should be able to see it, can see it. And you know, note this could change by date X, but just so you need to know for your piece of the project. There's going to be expansive world documentation. So as a GM is running a game, and as players do, they end up taking you somewhere you didn't think you would go. And you t -t 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 -t. you get on our, our platform and you search for the relevant information. You're going to learn a lot about that setting. Not just what we've written, but what has happened when other GMs have taken players there in the past and screenwriters and whoever. But then you're going to do some things. And when we talk about this continuity existing, I see a lot of anxiety with when we talk to writers about that and GMs because they're like, oh my gosh, well, I tried this. We tried to do a D&D &D game with three tables and we all like disagreed about what happened. We couldn't figure out how to reconcile the canon. And we have a really easy solution to that in the world of Vesser IP. One, propaganda is a thing. Governments literally lie all the time in their own best interest. They spin misinformation. They engage in misinformation campaigns that did not start in the era of mass media. That's been going around as long as governments govern. And two, people misremember what happened. Even when people try to tell the truth, they blow it. So when we take the notes from a game session and we go to canonize that into our world, those things are called rumors. They haven't been confirmed by the augury. It, this is the testimony of an expeditionary party of what happened. Do we have a situation where even well-meaning on Earth, two people go to the same area and experience something similar and come back with different interpretation of what occurred? Absolutely. So we build our narrative process on canonical information based on human testimony is uncertain and contradictory. You know, I'm old enough now that I'm, I've gotten really into history. And when you go and read historical accounts, first-hand witnesses wildly diverge. So that's baked in as an expectation. And your work as a player or a reader is to decide who do you believe. Or more importantly, to me, it's always 
less important when understanding history of like what factually occurred. Why did this person say what they said about what occurred? Which is far more interesting, and I hope our setting kind of brings that to people. Now, of course, we'll have behind the screen the canonical, this is what this place is like. This is what happened. But that won't always get shared with the audience because it'd be boring if it did, and there'd be nothing to fight about on forums if we put a neat bow on every contradiction. I so love how you introduce the idea of propaganda and then immediately say confirmed by the augury as true. (laughs) (laughs) That is fantastic. No notes. (laughs) For those of you who didn't hear our factions episode, the augury is like the intel secret service, secret police slash supervises the emergent part of the order of signs. And they would never lie to you. Never, Everything they say is never. 100% true all the time. 100%. They lie to each other. They lie to their bosses. They lie to the seven. They lie to themselves. I was going to say, don't don't we all lie to ourselves They're a bunch point. of liary liars. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, we're going to wrap up today's episode. We love answering your questions. It's actually really exciting for us when we see your questions come in. So please continue to send If you're like me and you're like, whoa, I guess I do like fantasy, please send in your questions. If you're like Mike and you love technical manuals and you want to hear the real sciencey stuff, please send in your questions. We like everything on all extremes and in between. And if you're like Anne, who was seven years old and liked the Limbus bread lumba spread and you want to know about the food of vesser send us questions but for the record Anne can roll hard in science as well yes absolutely hard. i mean clearly i think that's been hard demonstrated. <laughs> i think that's been demonstrate, demonstrated i was gonna say mike my my message is to you this morning yes i am basically just like we needed an additional voice for the podcast it could just be victory interviewing Anne. <laughs> it's true It is true. But we like to hear you, Mike. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You add a special spice that no one else can add. A rich baritone. (laughs) So thank you for listening, everyone. If you want to join our waitlist and be the first to know about upcoming events, please go to Vesser.com, V-E-S-S-E-R.com. And we hope you'll join us next week for more of Building Vesser. Today I'm going to use a fantasy term for goodbye, which would be... Namare. Oh, thank you, Anne. Pafawa Amediju Arasu.